Welcome you to the Source Summit. Um, on behalf of all of the Source team, we are so pleased to have all of you here. This is such an exciting day for us, and we are just so lucky to have everyone here with us. Uh, my name is Sarah Linton. I'm one of the two Source managers at the moment. Um, this year celebrates Source, Source's 10th year of community work um, in the Claremont community. Source was founded in 2005 by some very entrepreneurial students who wanted to find a way to connect Claremont students to the community in an impactful, sustainable way to create change. I'd like to take a moment to recognize our incredible Source team. Um, if you're a current member of Source or a Source alumni, please take a moment and stand up. Thank you for all of your hard work to put together this event and your work for our community. Over the past 10 years, Source has worked with over 17 community organizations. This year, we are currently working with seven nonprofit clients. If you are one, a current or previous client of Source, please stand up so we can thank you. We are so thankful for all of your support and for giving us the opportunity to make this happen. And as we look forward to the opportunity to work with more organizations in the future. Finally, we would like to thank our sponsors for this event. Kravis de Roulet, the Kravis Leadership Institute, and the Changemaker Initiative at Claremont McKenna College were all instrumental in making sure that this event could happen today. Um, additionally, we received support from Podges, Packing House Wines, Trader Joe's, and Sumcrest. So thank you to all of our sponsors. The summit's theme, Celebrating Local Innovation and Collaboration, was chosen because we wanted today to be a celebration of the phenomenal community work of the individuals here today, as well as a look towards the future of Claremont nonprofit organizations. We hope that today's sessions will inspire you to look at your organization and community differently, as well as provide you with tools to make your organization more effective. The combined impact of all of the organizations in the room today is truly phenomenal. In front of you, you will find a commitment card asking you to make three commitments to collaboration and innovation in your organization and the community. By the end of today, please fill this out and return it to us at the reception for a gift bag. These commitments are important to ensure that today's discussions truly come to fruition and have a lasting impact on the community. Without further ado, I would like to introduce President Hiram Chodosh, who will open up this event. President Chodosh has been an avid champion of collaboration and innovation across Claremont McKenna's campus, in, um, including pushing for CMC to become an Ashoka-designated changemaker campus. He has been a strong supporter of Source and the Claremont nonprofit community, and we are so pleased to have him kick off this event. Please welcome President Hiram Chodosh. Well, thank you, Sarah. And Thank you all uh, for being here today. I'm so grateful. In most instances, uh, a 10th anniversary celebration, uh, we would be looking back. And we'd have a nice lunch, and everyone would leave, and we'd be wondering, what do we do on Monday? In an exemplary way, uh, what today is about is not just looking back and patting ourselves on the back, but looking ahead and trying to gather the wits, uh, the extraordinary resources of the people in this room to not just look forward, but act forward. And I do believe that Source um, will represent a very important chapter in history of this college. Let's just reflect on it for a moment. Uh, as many of you know, the college started with the end of World War II, and the first students on this campus were mostly vets. And they had suspended their educations. They had sacrificed a tremendous amount. In many cases, their best friends had died in wartime, and they came back here with a hunger to learn, to catch up on the education that they had deferred, and also to get going, to work, and to build the body politic, to build the economy, to lift the society around them. And it is in that founding of this organization, of this great institution, that you find 
what I believe is the core methodology that drives us today. We learn to do. We don't just learn for learning, but we learn to do, to make an impact, to meet the challenges of our time, but we also do to learn. And it is that virtuous cycle of learning and doing that CMC is all about, and that source is an exemplar of what we expect out of this generation. Every generation has its challenges with solipsism and self-absorption and sometimes self-destructive behavior on the one hand, or the commitment to lead a meaningful life by attending to the needs of others. As in our founders, the commitment to lift the broader society. And in many ways, I think what we're doing here today is to honor that contribution of source. By example, to honor those traditions of CMC, and Jill Stark is here representing the great dynamic duo of Jack and Jill Stark, our president emeritus. Uh, Pam Gann, uh, president emerita, is here giving a talk also today. Again, you see the continuity of these commitments. But most of all, what we're trying to do is to meet what I would regard as the triple capacity gap of our society. What do I mean by triple capacity gap? First, everyone here. Everyone here is concerned about the challenges of education, of health care, of economic growth, poverty alleviation, and the environment. Everyone here is. And second, we're all concerned with how we develop the methodologies, the approaches, the processes, the innovations to address these underlying human conditions about which we're concerned. And third, and as the program reflects, we're all concerned, those of us who are active in trying to meet those challenges, with how we improve the capacities of our own, our own organizations. How do we leverage technology? How do we build human capital? How do we raise resources in the broadest sense? How do we develop impact research methodologies to make sure that what we're doing actually has the intended effect? These are the three challenges that come together, I think, for us today, for source and for change-making activity for CMC in the future. And what we need to counter this triple capacity gap is a triple threat of putting our attention through our own mining of the virtue of empathy to look out at the human condition and see what those problems are, to muster the creativity that leads to innovation that will meet those challenges and to have the courage to make the commitments to grow a strategy and a capacity together to improve the human condition, to lift the society around us. And so I'm very pleased to announce today that we are looking forward to a new fund. It starts with a $300,000 commitment of the Lewis family, Randall Lewis, whose two brothers went to CMC, whose three children went to CMC, a great community leader and businessman, has donated $300,000 for the next few years. It's a cash spendable gift to infuse support for source, for change-making activity in the Inland Empire. And it will be called the Lewis Family Fund for Inland Empire change making. And I am very pleased to announce it. It is just a start for us to capture where we've been and to leverage it in the future to meet the needs of the broader society through all of the great work that all of you, every single one of you in this room, has committed to and is doing and will do tomorrow. So thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. Uh, have a great conference this afternoon. I'm sorry that I can't stay for it because I have to go to Ashoka U's uh, Changemaker Conference in D.C. and meet our delegation uh, of Amy and Neela and eight students. 
uh, from CMC. So thank you all very much for coming and congratulations to Source and good luck in your work today and beyond. Thank you very much. President Chodas for that wonderful introduction. Thank you all for joining us at the Athenaeum today. My name is Alice Chang. I am a senior here at CMC and one of the two co-managers of Source. Not only do I have the privilege of working with some of the most passionate, inspiring students here on campus, I'm honored to be moderating this panel today with Wendy, Chalina, and Paul, all of whom have extensive experience in community collaboration and engagement. Paul Vandevetter is the president and CEO of Community Partners, a nonprofit he co-founded in 1992 to foster creative, collaborative projects and solutions to commu community challenges. He has really worked on the front lines of community development and net structured networks across the three sectors for over 20 years in, in at least 135 collaborative projects. Shalina Odbert is the co-founder and executive director of Kunkui Design Initiative a nonprofit that works to design and build public spaces in communities of extreme poverty in both Nairobi, Kenya and Southern California. In recognition of her work with KDI, American Express has recognized her as one of 15 global emerging social innovators. She's also a CMC alumna, so it's great to have you back on campus. Wendy Guerin is the president and CEO of the Ralph M. Parsons Foundation. In her 20 plus years of experience at the Parsons Foundation, she has worked with numerous nonprofits and foundations to support and invest in collaborative programs to enhance community partnerships and collaboration. Currently, she's leading a coalition of 11 nonprofits in the Nonprofit Collaborative Initiative to build the culture around collaboration in the social sector. Thank you all for joining us. So before we dive in, I'd like to ask the audience. Um, out of the audience, ra please raise your hand if you're currently working with a nonprofit organization or student-run organization that's currently engaged in some form of collaboration. A recent Bridgespan study found that over 91% of survey correspondents and respondents have had um, engaged in community collaboration, ranging from joint, progr joint programming, shared administrative costs to mergers. Um, today, our panelists are here to tell us more about community collaboration, its benefits, its, pit, its pitfalls, and how to avoid them. So without further ado, let's begin, and we'll have plenty of time for questions, so start thinking about what you'd like to learn from these panelists. Um, so I'm curious to learn what collaboration and community collaboration really means to you. Paul, do you want to start? Absolutely. Um, first of all, thanks to Sarah, thanks to Alice. Um, for organizing the event and leading. Um, thanks to Sarah Smith Orr, I told someone earlier, I'm in, uh, uh, I've been long enlisted in the standing army of Sarah Smith Orr fans. <laughs> and whenever she calls, I come. Uh, whether you know it or not, you are part of that army as well. <laughs> so get ready for duty. Um, thank you, Sarah. Um, you know, uh, community partners as an organization involved in the establishment of many different kinds of initiatives over the last 22 years um, became acquainted with the notion of collaboration and networks out of survival. Um, what we discovered early on was coalitions would come to us of multiple groups that needed to work together well. We found that we were giving them bad advice we were advising them as if they were classic organizations. They're not classic organizations. They're organizations of organizations. And the rules in those two settings, if you take nothing away today from this uh, conference and this conversation, remember that a classic organization is a hierarchy. It has someone in charge, objectives very clear, 
the goals, mission, and so on. And I can tell anybody in that organization what to do. Go to the setting of a network, and a network is multiple organizations where no one's in charge, relationships change fundamentally over time, mm -hmm. and agreement is the fundamental basis for moving forward or not. And conflict in a classic organization environment is driven down in the organization and solutions come up. In networks, multiple organization uh, collaboratives, uh, conflict is always on the surface because it's inevitable. In when many different organizations with many different approaches and points of view have to get together and work out a problem and work out an approach to working in the community. Classic and network settings, fundamentally different. That was the, the, the learning that led to this book, Networks That Work. And this is our survival raft. Um, <laughs> I recommend it to you because it's now been through two editions, and it was written with somebody who actually knows what they're talking about from the academic point of view, and me uh, and my colleagues from the practitioner point of view. And what became clear in the process of developing this book was when we work with coalitions, multi-organizational networks, we're working with a different, fundamentally different animal. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop there and uh, let the uh, rest of the uh, group make their comments, and then we could go in further to this if people like. Great. Shalina, would you like to give us your perspective? Sure. Well, I'm uh, a practitioner, first and foremost, and we're a nonprofit design and community development organization uh, whose mode of practice is through community partnerships. So any project that we do, whether it's in a slum in Nairobi or in a farm worker community in the Coachella Valley, we are working directly with community residents as our client. So for us, collaboration is um, critical to what we do and how we do it. Um, but beyond that, as, as an organization, we often collaborate with other organizations to get those projects done. Um, and I was thinking about it after we had our initial conversation, and for us, collaboration is really important, but to be very honest, it's, it's really hard to do well. And for us, collaboration, whether, again, we're talking about Nairobi or the US or anywhere in between, usually falls into three categories. Um, and the first one is a collaboration between us, uh, the community, group or group of residents that we're working with and some local government entity. So um, in the US, uh, in the Coachella Valley, we work with the Parks and Recreation Department. Um, and in Nairobi, we work with the uh, Water Agency or sometimes the City Council. Um, so that's a, that's a common form of collaboration that we have within the organization. Then there's another one that is several nonprofit organizations uh, working together to enact the same mission. And that one um, is like the network that you're talking about. And I think we do, the, the structure that each collaboration takes uh, depends on the, the goals of the collaboration. Sometimes we are collaborating to be able to work at a larger scale. So as a small organization, uh, as a design firm, we can only really build one project at a time, but the problems of a slum are much bigger than any one project could solve. So we partner with the water agency or the city council so that the work that we're doing at this very local level might be sort of adopted at the larger scale and implemented um, at, at a wider range. Um, and so that's a really important reason for collaborating for us. And, and usually those partnerships are very effective. Um, sometimes, and I think this is important to note, sometimes in those dynamics, we end up, you know, it's not a true 50-50 partnership. Maybe what the government entity is lending is more of their name or their legitimacy, and we're still the ones doing all the real work. Um, but that's okay because we're bringing different things to the table. Um, and the other one, the sort of network of uh, equal nonprofit organizations working together, um, that one is really hard to do well. Uh, it's hard to have six organizations 
uh, all of whom have a director and a mission working on the same thing um, in a way that doesn't dilute what comes out the other end because people have different ways of approaching it. It's hard to determine who the leadership really is. Um, it can be done, but it takes, it takes a lot of work. And the reason to do that is often um, because you want to increase the scope of the project. So we are a design firm. We may be in a network where we're working with a policy firm so that whatever we're doing on the ground can also leverage some sort of policy change. And then we may be working with, um, I don't know, a neighborhood um, community group because they are really invested in a particular place. So for us, I think collaboration takes many forms, if I could sum it up. Um, and while it, it, it can be tremendously beneficial as a practitioner, um, it's really hard to do well. And <laughs> we've, we've done it, we've succeeded a lot of times, but sometimes uh, there are moments where we think, hmm, maybe we should have you know, tried this a different way. <laughs> okay. Juliana, Wendy? Um, it's a pleasure to be here with you today and really a privilege. Um, from the, you know, the, the perch of a foundation, we're really looking at two different ecosystems. One is investing directly in nonprofits. And really, for more than a quarter century, philanthropy has asked nonprofits to collaborate. Um, sometimes we've um, almost forced you to and you know, created um, distant, you know, odd incentives uh, that are really top down, not organic, and almost designed to fail. Um, we did a conference 25 years ago for Southern California uh, grant makers uh, that Jack Shakely uh, did a, uh, uh, the prior CEO there, uh, did a role play about collaboration. Um, and it made it really very clear how hard it is to do. Um, I think we're in a much better place than we were 25 years ago, where um, there are really uh, great opportunities to forge interconnectedness. Um, and I think we are, from philanthropy, not preaching to you what to do, but trying to walk in your shoes. So I, so I think the change that I see is more of a willingness of <coughs> investors, really, corporations, family foundations, private foundations, community foundations, to come together. Sometimes it's around a rubric of collective impact, but I think it's a, an awareness that big problems require both more resources and more um, people at the table with expertise if you really want to drive impact. If all you want to do is feel good, you can do one-off grant making. But if you really want to move the needle, You've got to figure out ways uh, to work collaboratively together. Now, <clears throat> uh, two years ago, we started something called the Nonprofit Sustainability Initiative. Um, three foundations uh, had an epiphany at the same moment. We saw a speaker talking about David Lapiana. You may know his work. Uh, he sort of cornered the market on uh, the intellectual uh, property of asking the nonprofit sector, NGOs, to think about efficiency, program alignment, back office consolidation, and mergers. And mergers and acquisitions is a common tool for the business world. It's just part of a toolkit for businesses running effectively. And it has not been something that our world has even uh, known the language of, let alone had the capacity to do. And we came away from hearing this uh, uh, conference presentation, which was very provocative, and we thought, how can we impact this? So together, we decided we would have a conference focused around collaboration. And what came out of that was a pooled fund that three of us started. We each came up with a fairly substantial amount of money. And then we turned to our friends. And we raised money from um, eight other foundations. Now, it's not really fair to say I lead it. Um, because collaborations need to be entirely communal to work. If you want ownership and if you want visibility and you want your name on it, collaboration isn't going to work. You have to be willing to forego um, all of that to drive to consensus because it's a consensus model of how do you get things done. So there are three managing partners, the three 
initial foundations. The others were happy to put their money in and get reports, and that's good because it would be hard to have 11 people at a table um, making all of the decisions. We're now in our second cohort. What we've done is we ask nonprofits to come, their CEO with a board leader, to enter a process. Um, first they think about it, and then they enter a process of where we, uh, they can apply for funds to have a consultant to help them drive forward their collaboration. Mm -hmm. Whether it's a back office consolidation or a program alignment, one of the most interesting projects that happened was in Long Beach were six agencies serving homeless population in different ways, mental health, housing, uh, re you know, uh, ordinary, uh, primary care, um, recognized they were serving the same population but not sharing any data or anything. And they were able to come together to get past the legal HIPAA uh, requirements of privacy to create a case management plan that allowed them to have one plus one be three or in this case, six organizations maybe being more like nine because they could work more effectively together. I think after 2008, these would be the sort of uh, final things to touch on uh, from my remarks to kick this off. Um, we're in a new normal, and it really is a time of scarcity and a, and a time of a lot of concern with underlying economies. Um, no one really knows what will happen economically. And so I think it's driven a focus for all of us in how do we make change happen? Mm -hmm. And if we do it sort of idiosyncratically and everyone needing their own identity, we're not gonna be effective at making change happen. Mm -hmm. So what I see is I see the community is responding, you're all heroes and that you're doing the hard work because there's no question it's harder to collaborate than it is to do your own thing. Um, it takes time, and time is the most, you know, at the end of the day, may be the most scarce resource. But if, if you get the impact on the people you're trying to serve, then it's all worth it. So um, I think it's a very exciting time uh, with respect to collaboration. And, and I think that both the nonprofit service delivery community is doing it, and I think, you know, funders, um, are not just uh, telling you to do it, but we're working hard to try to do it too. Well, great. Thank you for those really rich, um, insightful introductions. I have a lot to unpack already. But just a side note, a lot of you guys mentioned the theme of um, scaling your impact and this idea of um, in order to really make a difference, you need to have something called collective impact. In all of your participant folders, there's a wonderful article by the Stanford Social Innovation Review Highly recommend it. I read it for Professor Gann's class. It's really, really interesting, and it's about how you know the only way we can make a change that's lasting is to have these large lattices of organizations um, organizing together. So one of the questions that I have for you guys is, you know, it's really important to align on a similar common goal and to be measured against that similar goal um, in order to have an effective collaborative relationship. So in your past um, practice and experience. What have you found is the best way to you know, get a group of people together sitting at the same table and talking with the same language about the same goals so that you know, when you reconnect and come together again, you are on the same page and working towards a similar goal versus working in idiosyncratic ways? I would like to pick up on what Wendy said. Time is the big asset that needs investing in collaborative situations. Um, also, however, urgency. And I think the driver for most collaborative behavior is some urgent, present priority that we alone as an organization couldn't successfully address mm -hmm. at the scale that it needs addressing. And I, I want to pull back for a second. One of the most complex collaborative networks on the planet operating today, and a great example to look at when you look at behaviors is the United Nations, 190 or so organizations functioning as a managed network. Nobody's the boss, mm -hmm. the executive secretary, right, or the secretary general is a very humble titled position. No one's in charge. The United States doesn't run the United Nations, sometimes to its great dismay. <laughs> um, but the, the notion of multiple organizations, states, functioning quite separately and well 
uh, on their own and in their own jurisdictions, coming together and agreeing that world peace, peace in the world, was the driving urgent priority post-World War II is what the, makes that organization have a, a center. Note, not everyone agrees on what the definition of peace is or conflict. But because that's common in network settings, you can't go into these settings and say, everybody's going to agree on the exact same definition of the problem. There's many different definitions of problems. What you have to go in with, though, is a sense that our purpose, the purpose we hold in common, is bigger than any one of our organizations could address, and the priorities that we address in, in trying to fulfill that purpose may change and shift and alter as conditions around us change, as we enter a time of relative calm in the world and economic prosperity, or as now, when we have multiple conflicts in multiple regions of the country, and United Nations kind of conversation and dialogue has set a whole different set of priorities. So I use that big example because it's, it contains many of the characteristics of the smaller examples that you run into in communities all the time. And the reasons that you pull together uh, in network settings, multiple organizations, is because the size of the problem outstrips any single organization's capacity to address it. And no one's in charge of the solution so that you work out ways to manage and govern this um, conflict-filled or potentially conflict-filled process and make sure that the manager is not the person who is directing what you do, but managing the processes by which you do what you do. Yeah, I, you know, I'd, I'd add on to that. I agree with the urgency. Um, you know, there has to be a motivating driver to get you to do work in an out of the ordinary fashion. Um, sometimes, you know, it's, it's a little bit like never let a, a crisis uh, go to waste. Um, you may be aware that in Los Angeles, there's been um, a, a county, there's really a crisis uh, around foster care. It's been in the newspapers about uh, children dying uh, in foster care, the worst possible outcomes, and a system really in crisis. And um, there was a Blue Ribbon Commission that recommended uh, changes to the Board of Supervisors. And it was, there was a question as to whether or not the board was going to adopt these policy recommendations. And 17 foundations came together for the first time to write a letter to use our influence collaboratively to say to the board, we're big investors in foster care. We care about these children. They're our children. They're the community's children. And we're paying attention, and we want to see reform. Mm -hmm. That was a collaboration. And it, was, uh, it had an impact. Um, we got a four to one vote out of the board to move forward with reforms to help protect children and to make the county more cohesive and not siloed in the way it deals with uh, kids highly at risk. But to do that, you have to have trust. And I think the, the often neglected part of collaboration is you have to build up social relationships that have to be in place before you need them. Um, if you don't have them, you're, it's, all, it's so personal. Yeah. It's very um, about the people in many ways. And so uh, it is worth the time to try to establish those relationships because I think it makes it possible to build on them. So I'll offer one more example uh, also in the newspapers this past year. Undocumented young people coming unaccompanied from Central America, kids as young as eight years old riding on the tops of trains to the United States to freedom and reconciliation with their families. Well, uh, big crisis, don't know what's going on. Uh, foundations came together to create a fund to both study the problem. How many kids was it in LA County? What is the actual impact? Turns out it was 3,000 kids, not unsubstantial. Uh, and then, what, what are the needs at the, in the nonprofit community of agencies serving those kids? Together, we could step up and pool a million dollars to then re-grant to the agencies that were being 
impacted so these kids could be well served. We couldn't have done that as individuals. And the only reason we could do it together as a collaborative is because we've developed um, like a muscle memory. We know each other, we trust each other, we can work together. Great, thank you so much. One of, um, so what I'm hearing is one of the pitfalls of collaboration and f is finding the right partner and, ident and identifying who they are. Um, what are some other pitfalls that can occur when you try to collaborate and it's not necessarily the right organization, not everyone is aligned on the same goal? What are some of your experiences on failures of when you've tried to collaborate? Well, just again from the practitioner standpoint, I think um, the, you know, the biggest failure is that the, the project doesn't reach its goal because some division happens that's irreparable along the way that could be something as simple as, you know, the personalities of the organizations collaborating just decide they can't make it work anymore. Thankfully, that has never happened with us yet. Um, but but I, we've certainly seen it happen. So that's the worst possible outcome that all of these organizations align resources, they, um, you know, commit to working together, they devote this time and energy, and what should have been a, you know, a greater, impact because of their collaboration um, sort of ends up with no impact at all. Um, and then I think there are a lot of minor ones, and, and this notion of relationships I think is a big one. Um, typically, at least in our experience, we've never entered into a collaboration with an organization that we didn't know at all. Mm -hmm. I think that's mm -hmm. really hard to do um, because so much of it is, especially smaller organizations, it's about the relationships, the people that you're going to be around the table with when you're trying to determine your plan of action or your common mission or the, the steps that you're going to take. Um, but I think that the better you know the organization, the better the outcome is, the more of that getting to know each other that you have to do along the way. Mm -hmm. it, it adds time to the length of the pro project. We have, there's one collaboration that we are a part of that has six organizations working together. And I would say we knew three of them very well, and then those other ones knew the other three. And I think that it's safe to say we've added probably six months onto the process of launching this project, just because it took us so long to sit around a table and be very clear about our common objective and our path to meet that objective. Um, so I would say an, a pitfall is that of the, the timeline really gets extended uh, to a place that ends up taking more resources of dollars, um, you know, human resources, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, the literature on networks will tell you and affirm what these two have just said. Fundamental to the formative conditions of any network is pre-existing relationships. Because imagine coming into a room and trying to work collaboratively with people you don't know and whose rhythms and habits and approaches are foreign to you. You can't do it. So the fundamental uh, formative condition is pre-existing relationships are in place. One of the great pitfalls of networks is a failure on the part of people from organizations who are representing organizations coming into the network and not addressing the things that are going to, because we're all different, cause them conflict. Mm -hmm. And an evaluation at the very outset, as you're forming purpose and establishing initial priorities, is ultimately to say, what are, what are the kinds of things we're gonna fight about, right? One of the things that networks, in, groups in network settings often fight about is money. So, uh, a funder comes along and says, we love what you guys are doing and what you're about. Uh, let's put some money into that effort. And it ends up, a lot of the time, if the network isn't matured, being a hand grenade uh, as opposed to a, help, a hand up. And that's problematic. I'm a great proponent when you go as an organization into a network setting, you bring your own resources. You capitalize the network from the start on your own. Mm -hmm. Your organization makes a financial commitment. It commits people resources 
usually at the highest level of the organization um, compared to the other organizations that are in the setting. You want the highest level of authority coming from an organization into the network so that decisions don't always have to be referred back to outside higher authorities. So resources, uh, organizational human capitalization of the effort. Um, if, if organizations are not prepared to do that, going into the network setting, they're, um, they, I've seen more than one network fail because those commitments weren't there. Finally, I believe it's important to set a very high bar of entry into, or at least a bar of entry into a network setting. It's not a come ye all, we, you know, let's, let's put on a show kind of thing. Um, I think it's always better in network settings to say, uh, here are the qualifications that we're looking for. A history, uh, working in a particular community, a, a willingness to make a financial commitment, a time commitment um, in the year to two year length or depending on the, the nature of the problem. All of those commitments agreed to by everyone and adhered to by everyone make the setting so much more predictable um, and people aren't coming and going and in and out and um, oh, we've got a new idea for a person. There's a measured way of moving new resources and new organizations into the network setting so that the, uh, uh, the, the bonds of relationship are established tightly at the outset. And you can manage a network in this kind of simultaneous, loose, tight way if you've made some fundamental commitments, often in a written agreement of a charter or something like that, that helps everyone remember, right? Remember what we committed ourselves to by getting into this situation. Great. I'll oh. add one yeah, thing to that. Um, in, in terms of those commitments, one thing, again, that we've learned from our own experience is um, committing to the role that you'll play within the collaboration. Um, several times uh, there are certain areas that maybe an organization is focused on. For example, we are a design organization primarily. Another organization we've collaborated with is a policy organization. But beyond those really broad things that we do, there are many things that we both do. Mm -hmm. So the policy group, they do some community organizing. We absolutely do community organizing. We actually also do some policy work. Mm -hmm. So it, if those things aren't defined in a really detailed way from the outset, it, when you get to those things where many of the groups within the collaborative effort could do it, mm -hmm. it becomes um, tough territory. Yeah, I really like that insight because it goes back to what you are saying before. It's not a 50-50 split on responsibility. Every organization that comes to the table needs to recognize where their value add is. Um, so yeah, thank you for that insight. Um, I want to make sure there's plenty of time for questions. So we're going to open it up to the floor for a dialogue with the audience. Um, who, are, who has microphones right now? Sumer and Anna Shepard, both wonderful source consultants, are going to come around um, with microphones. So if you do have a question, go ahead and raise your hand, and we'll start or a comment that elaborates even better. Yeah. Uh, I'm Freeman Allen from Sustainable Claremont. Uh, I used to teach chemistry at Pomona College, mm -hmm. but for the last few years, we've been working on sustainable issues here in Claremont. Our model is to work closely with the city uh, and with in cooperation with the Ranch of Santa Ana Botanic Garden We've recently opened a resource center. Alexis Reyes, who is at the table here, is our part-time employee there. Uh, our, our concept uh, kind of follows on the Oberlin plan, uh, where uh, they brought the community together uh, to uh, have a, an action plan for the city, uh, where they put together a $135 million project and very successful. Oberlin's a town of about 8,000 8, people, uh, and uh, they have succeeded in bringing a great element of the community together uh, and use that as a potential for funding. And we see Claremont doing the same thing. 
And I wondered what your comments are about, um, you were mentioning it's important to have uh, groups come in with their, bring the funding and so forth. The concept here would be to get groups coming together to seek funding mutually with a, an overall project, a, an action plan. And I wonder what you think about that concept for networking and the potential here in Claremont to do something like that. Sustainable Claremont would like to catalyze something of that sort. So Wendy, maybe, maybe you talk because well, they're, they're <laughs> gonna come to you with a proposal. You know, I would say um, that private-public partnerships are you know, another kind of collaboration that we haven't touched on uh, in this conversation. We've really been focusing on um, community-based organizations uh, collaborating. And um, I think around something like sustainability, there's probably natural alignments with public players um, that I would seek to identify and draw into your collaboration. Um, and I think that um, often, you know, you'll find that you, if you can work out those details and be coherent, that it, it's a more compelling project. If you can put forward a collaboration that looks like it will have more impact because it's got more players, um, I think that, that will draw uh, investment. We um, have, sorry, we've worked uh, in public-private partnerships and also with groups of um, NGOs to seek joint funding and funders, um, large funders across the, the nation have always said to us that uh, that's been the strength of the application is that uh, we've come to them with all the pieces already in place. So we already have the uh, Parks and Recreation Department on board um, and that sort of takes away a lot of the questions that they may have in approving or in, in granting the funding. They see the sustainability of the plan. So I think that as we've been saying, it's, it's funders like it and they're doing it themselves. There have been, there've been great instances in our work in the Coachella Valley where um, because we had this collaboration established, one funder bought into it and then they drew other funders that were interested in a similar um, objective into the project as well. So I think, I think that it can absolutely happen and I, and I agree with this advice to um, see where there's a, a, an alignment with uh, the public sector. Danger, um, <laughs> a, 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 there is a danger uh, and a pitfall potential. <laughs> Huh? And uh, it goes by the, 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 the sort of the notion of he who pays the piper calls the tune. Um, so when funders get overly engaged in network settings, they begin to drive the prioritization of issues, which is, again, takes me back to the being a proponent of self-capitalization for the operation of the network, inviting funders in for specific work group kinds of projects um, that might benefit from additional resources, research projects, policy formation projects, and so on. Um, and it's, it's keeping a different kind of relationship with uh, very important players in the community who lend something that I've always thought of, and, and this applies for cities as well, civic sanction to an effort. What's civic sanction? Effectively, it's a kind of uh, protection on the part of powerful people who aren't necessarily direct engagees in the network setting, um, but who want to see the power unleashed of multiple organizations tackling a particular problem. And funders are great at lending their sanction by funding projects. Political bodies are great at, say, at, at giving uh, political downfield blocking to efforts that might be controversial on the part of, of the group as they undertake the change-making work that they're involved in. So I, I always look for civic sanction. Who's protecting this? Who wants this to happen? Um, you know, who is their uh, Nelson Mandela uh, that will bless but not drive the, the venture? Before we um, move on to another question, I wanna dive more deeper into that. So Wendy, when you come in with um, the co coalition of funders, how do you kind of don't step past the line and cross the line of becoming too engaged of a funder? 
You know, I, I'm a big believer in um, what I would call philanthropic freedom. There are some funders who uh, ap uh, approach their grant making uh, like uh, venture capitalists. Um, they want a seat at the table. They want to be a board member. They want to be directly, deeply engaged in the work of the nonprofit. And if the nonprofit wants that and the funder wants that, I say, you know, that's why there's chocolate and vanilla. But I represent a foundation that takes really, uh, there's a continuum of that to, you know, uh, the other extreme, we're maybe two thirds of the way down the line. Uh, because we want to be engaged in, in the sense of authentic conversation uh, with our grantees. But we are what I would call, a, we're a responsive foundation. So we think it's really important that nonprofits are the drivers and that we're, um, investors, that we're not, um, people talk about there being partnership, and you know, really if, you, if you're sitting on $400 million, you just have power. And even we find, even in asking questions at a site visit, you know, sometimes people want to scurry to like give you the right answer. And you know, you're maybe just asking a question. And certainly what we never want to do from our point of view is tell you what to do. Because why do we know? You know, what if we're entirely wrong? You know, do no harm. Um, so we really uh, want to be listening closely to the nonprofits and not dictating. So for example, if somebody wants to do a strategic plan, um, we're not going to meddle in who you should hire. That's your decision. Um, and, and it's really a philosophical approach to grant making. And I almost want to be further back from um, the action because of that inherent imbalance. Because with the best of intentions, um, damage can be done, actually. So that, but that said, if somebody wants that investment model um, and everybody's happy with it, um, it, I think the freedom of uh, this wonderful uh, model we have in this country is that because there's all different flavors, um, it's a big goose. And if we start saying this is the only way, um, I think you kill the goose. And so I'm, I'm, I'm personally very open to all approaches, but, person, but I don't want to be the one telling you all uh, what to do. That said, I just want to say one thing. Probably every student here, uh, just about all of you, because you're so capable and ambitious and have so much talent, want to follow in her shoes and create a nonprofit. And um, I was on a panel not very long ago with uh, another foundation CEO who runs the Community Foundation, and she said, don't do it. <laughs> now, I'm not going to be that black and white, but you know, we don't want to tell you or Wendy Kopp, who created Teach for America, don't start the new thing. But there are too many nonprofits, and there is too much redundancy and replication and waste baked into our system which is kind of ego-driven in some ways. And so if you have an idea, we think you should start with collaboration. We think you should um, look around, see who else is doing what you're doing, at least learn from them. And you might find you could have more power if you link up with them. You know, everybody doesn't have to have their own sandbox. Um, a bigger sandbox might be better for everybody. Thanks, Wendy. Let's take another question. Hi, Seth from First Street Gallery Art Center. I was wondering if you could speak to another kind of collaboration which is between nonprofits and for-profit corporations. And so obviously nonprofits can gain in donations or pro bono work from corporations and corporations can uh, contribute to their corporate social responsibility campaigns by you know, putting a face to their goodwill. But I was wondering if you could speak to some of the pitfalls for nonprofits of, of it entering into those relationships uh, with the for-profit corporations? Um, just uh, talked to an organization the other day uh, that was looking for some advice and guidance. They're uh, looking at a very specific, narrow niche disease and the families uh, that suffer with that disease. One of their, uh, several of their partners are uh, pharmaceutical companies, right? Um, driven by 
profit and development, certainly there to uh, address uh, this particularly devastating disease, slow down its effects, and so on. However, the, one of the obvious dangers is um, if they're bringing resources to the table that this venture needs to uh, operate, uh, is there a way uh, that that in some way influences the programming of the organization? Big pitfall, um, one that can be worked out with careful agreements and some steadfastness on the part of the nonprofit organization. Um, but the agreement, I think, uh, as to how far the organization's programming and priorities are going to be uh, uh, either uh, framed or distorted by the collaboration with a for-profit partner has to be a question. It's one of those things that might cause you to fight down the road. And the last thing you want is a big, ugly public fight um, if you're in partnership with a highly visible entity. You know, I, I'd add to that, too, that um, volunteers aren't free. You know that. You know, they take uh, training and mentoring and supervision and uh, it's just like having an intern in your office. Um, you may not be paying them, and of course there's a big debate about should interns be paid, and is it exploitive, and you know, we won't go off into that sidebar. <laughs> but um, what we know is that businesses uh, are only about 5% of giving, uh, according to Giving USA. And then when you drill down into that, it is largely um, gifts in kind of things like pharmaceuticals and volunteerism. And you know, so, so Disney has their Team Disney and they'll come out and build a playground for you or something like that. That's great, but it's not free to you as the organization. And so what I would say is a pitfall is it won't go well if you don't invest in, in helping the volunteers um, be effective uh, for your organization. I think they, you know, it, it can be messy and unsatisfactory on both sides if you don't uh, work hard at uh, setting boundaries, expectations, all those kinds of things. So that, so that at the end of the day, something good came out of it uh, for the clients uh, and customers uh, and, and for those who are being generous with their time. We've just recently um, started to partner uh, with for-profit organizations, whether it be for uh, in-kind support or um, funding or volunteers. Uh, and we were, I guess, a bit resistant to it in the early years of the organization. And the approach that we've taken to it now is that we feel like the only partnerships in, with the for-profit sector that we're looking for at the moment are the ones that we define. So when we see a very specific need that our organization has and we feel like there's a, a very obvious for-profit partner that might be able to support that idea or that defined need, then we continue to pursue the, the collaboration or the partnership. And for us, that's been a way to help uh, avoid this pitfall of, of um, you know, either an experience that isn't equally beneficial for the organization and the business, or um, going into this other pitfall where uh, you are, you may be influenced uh, unnecessarily or improperly by the uh, corporate partner. Another question? Uh, hello, uh, my name is, <coughs> my name is Richard Shank. And I'm here at the invitation of Bridging the Gap um, for uh, survivors of traumatic brain injury. Um, <clears throat> I met Celeste Palmer, uh, who founded that organization um, almost serendipitously. I was talking about my own nonprofit, which I'm just starting, uh, Arts and Crafts Services for Every Purpose. One of the things that I'd like to know and understand is out of this, will I be able to find um, uh, resources here at the Claremont Colleges. I grew up in Claremont, and I've come back after being away for many years. And uh, the Claremont Colleges are a tremendous resource for everything, uh, profit, 
for profit and not for profit, and just general entertainment in terms of the wealth of, of artistic opportunities and, and, um, and uh, uh, visual uh, uh, opportunities and galleries and things of that nature. But I'd like to find out and I'd like to hear from the um, panel if there's a direct path to find out more about the services that are being offered to nonprofits and how we go about um, communicating that. Thank you. Well, you know, we could, uh, <laughs> one of the first places I would say is go to the Center for Nonprofit Management. Uh, yes, it's all the way in LA, but or they source. also do a lot of, and, or source, that's right. Um, your local source for, yes. that's right. Um, maybe you could become a project of source. We'd love that. Come talk to us after. Well, and, and, and that connectivity to these <laughs> exactly. so-called capacity building organizations, um, you know, that is the term of art these days in the nonprofit sector, capacity building. Um, uh, Community Partners defines itself in that way. Um, Taproot Foundation does. Executive Service Corps, which is represented here today. I'm going to be on a later panel. Um, there are a class of organizations that are capacity building. And what they bring, what they collect, what they aggregate is like what a university aggregates, knowledge. And I would, I would say, well, you know, look to them for knowledge and specialized knowledge about a field. I want to add I always encourage projects that are forming under the community partners umbrella to look at the fundi funders and the funding community as first and genuinely and authentically a knowledge resource. Why? They, Wendy sits at the end of a pipeline of demand every day, um, proposals coming in the door constantly, um, and knows if you, uh, the Los Angeles community so far better and the problems that it faces because she's at that pipeline. If you're setting up something new, why wouldn't you want to go to the person who had the most comprehensive knowledge about practice in that particular arena and use their knowledge as a way of forming the niche, the particular niche that you're going to um, pursue, widen, and, and get your traction in at, uh, as a new venture in the community. Um, so I would look at them as knowledge sources as I would look at this university mm -hmm. and at capacity, capacity builders generally. Thank you. Another question? Hi, um, I'm wondering about mergers for nonprofits. One of the chapters of an organization I'm involved with is considering merging. And I would wonder about your feedback about what kind of questions an organization should ask itself before moving forward with a merger. What are the things, what are the pitfalls that can come out of a merger? And what are the things you need to do to prepare yourself for that process? Well, you know, you almost have to date before you get married. <laughs> And, um, and the reason you want to do that is you want to discover are the two organizations compatible? Do you share values? Uh, there were two uh, organizations uh, in the San Fernando Valley that were both serving um, uh, people who had had cancer, you know, in the aftermath. And one of them was willing to go down the road of uh, collecting reimbursement from insurance companies. And the other did not want to go there. They, they did not want to be a third party. Uh, well, they, they, you know, on the surface, it looked like they could merge. But as you got into it, it was pretty quickly clear that uh, their philosophical differences were going to make it impossible for them uh, to get together. And so taking the time to examine um, sort of core beliefs and values um, and then there is a series of, um, uh, I would say that uh, the La Piana book, Merging Widely, uh, will help give you sort of a, a playbook on things to think about. Um, you know, because there doesn't have to be a success, a, uh, a survivor. There could be two merged boards where you take members from each board and you really create 
a, a new entity out of the two old, or it could be an acquisition. Is there one organization that's much, much stronger than the other, and it, there's an important service, and it really should be subsumed by the bigger organization? So there's not one answer, um, but what is true is that at the end of the day, it's not just the merger negotiation and executing the merger, which also has legal issues wrapped up into it. Um, if you're serving an impoverished population, a public counsel offers free pro bono legal service to help nonprofits uh, finalize a merger. But then after the merger, there's execution costs you know, uh, that you might not think about. There could be two leases or staff uh, that need compensation or uh, new letterhead. Um, all of those are real costs. And so I think a playbook like the La Piana book is helpful. Um, if there's a lot at stake, you know, bringing in a consultant to help um, is not a bad idea because the reason people don't sell houses themselves, you know, 6% is a big fee to pay if you're selling a house in California. Why is it that you would pay somebody $40,000 to sell your house? Mm -hmm. Well, it's because it's emotional and complex. And so um, if the stakes are high, um, bringing in a consultant with expertise is also something that every organization should think about. And, and a lot of people ask, uh, say, well, why aren't uh, mergers so easy? They're, they're happening all the time in the for-profit sector. Mm -hmm. Well, remember the cultural origins of commercial organizations versus civil society organizations. Commercial organizations generally have a bottom line comparator, right? But still, mergers, even in commercial corporations, fail 50% of the time because of cultural misfit, right? In the nonprofit sector, the, the potential for misfit is doubled and trebled because nonprofit organizations emerge from distinct communities and distinct community priorities. They are creatures of culture quite frequently. And they're anchored in that culture from their leadership and their boards on down to the functional um, uh, uh, program people who are delivering services. Yeah. And when you try to blend that um, uh, just without considering the importance of cultural difference, um, it, it becomes very hard, which is why network behavior is an alternative to a full-on right. merger as you would see in the commercial arena. Mm -hmm. And network behavior stops short of in complete interdependence, but it does move toward interdependence in a very measured kind of way. And that's the advantage of not giving up your organizational autonomy quite at the start. Um, uh, networks are a way to do that dance that Wendy was talking about. Um, there's also a saying, you may have heard it, uh, culture eats strategy for lunch. <laughs> <laughs> and it's important to remember. Thanks, Wendy. Thanks, Paul. We have time for one more question. Hi, I'll try to make this brief. I'm Jim Wilson. Uh, until a couple of months ago, I was uh, serving on, on the board of the Claremont Community Foundation. So this has some spin on it. <laughs> um, one of the, uh, in, in six years on the board, I, I was uh, lucky enough to lead a strategy process you know, as a board member, which had its own difficulties. But um, we came up with uh, some, some tent poles of our strategy, and one of them was to take a, take a higher profile as a, as a uh, facilitator, collaborator, convener. Mm -hmm. But that was something that you know is within the charter, but we never really had stepped up to it and figured out how to do it. So uh, we actually hired Source a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. You guys might remember this. So yeah, so the idea was Can we get your microphone? microphone. Claremont has the issue of too many nonprofits. You heard it from me. You know, it's probably not nice, not not a nice thing to say, but you know, we've got you know, I don't know, 80 or 100 organizations, and they're all set up the same way. You know, volunteer boards and volunteer staff, and very few full-time resources, and kind of hitting up the same 
pockets in town, you know, asking for, you know, three finger numbers uh, for the most part, not asking a whole lot, doing a lot of fundraising okay. stuff. And uh, so nobody has any real development staff, very few, I mean, there's some exceptions. But, um, you know, the idea of merging, uh, making the issues bigger that we're dealing with, um, serving more people under, under a certain, you know, single program, taking that outside the community maybe to get funding. Uh, we, we saw that as an opportunity, but mm -hmm. <coughs> we only got as far as our source group creating a profile of all the organizations in town. So we got this little database. So the idea was to have a one-stop shop, go somewhere, see what your, you know, your options are as a funder or a, you know, a donor to uh, you know, participate in the community somehow. And the next step was always to begin the collaboration. Okay, we got a half a dozen people in this zone, eight or 10 people in that zone. Let's get folks talking and figure out how to take the next step. And uh, thanks for listening to that question. But I wanted to ask you guys, <laughs> what's, a, what's a, a logical next step? Well, I, I, I do think that foundations, uh, particularly community foundations, are rooted in community and do have this convening power that um, may be greater than the ability to write checks. Mm -hmm. And so, but, but the, the institution has to be willing to invest some staff time in helping to drive the conversations. So, you know, it could be that um, a community foundation might help the executive directors of agencies that it perceives as having common interests to a brown bag lunch four times a year. Um, if you ask for the meeting, they'll come because you're a funder. Uh, if you give people a pizza, it, it helps too. And relationships could evolve out of that, out of shared interests. Mm -hmm. um, and so you could set the table in a very low key way and be patient um, and they will come. Um, and you see what comes out of that. I've been on the um, practitioner side of one of those coalitions uh, or one of those convenings that was done by um, a, a funder in the LA area and, and it was done a little bit differently. It was rather than a one-time event, they began oh, sort of a monthly exactly. uh, assembly of these organizations and it was very um, low commitment. You could come if you want. There was a, an agenda sort of led by the funder and in fact, one of the collaborations that we are a part of now that we're really excited about came after being a part, after going to those meetings for about six to eight months. And not regularly, but mm -hmm. if not for that convening organization, we wouldn't have found ourselves there. So I would agree that that's a great next step. And, and, now, and I love the convening notion of people who care beyond their own private selves mm -hmm. as a solution to this notion, and I, and I think it's, a little dangerous to just make it a mantra that there are too many nonprofits because there is too little civility <laughs> in our society and never a dearth of innovation. I, 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 always the need for greater innovation and in the social sector. And if nonprofits are, in, as I think they are, the most organized form uh, expression of civil society then the impulse is what you want to reward and encourage in communities. And rather than taking the, the measure of too many nonprofits, I think the larger question is how much civility and innovation do we have in our community and how can we encourage that further and what you come up with is a great solution to that. Thank you. And before we close, I'd love to hear from each of you um, from a very high level perspective, what the ongoing trends are in the nonprofit sector specific to collaboration. So for instance, if we were to have the summit five or 10 years from now, what do you think we'd be talking about then? You guys wanna start? I'm not good at the, you know, <laughs> predicting the future. Um, well, or I maybe two to three years, it doesn't have to be 10. <laughs> I would say one that you've touched on and we see over and over again are these collaborations of funders, but, but in a very, not in the pitfall way that you described, in a very enlightened way, where, where funders are coming together and saying collectively, we don't really know 
how to address this problem, but we recognize that it is a problem and it's a big one. And so if we can collectively pool our resources and then begin to ask the practitioners to help us unpack this problem, um, then we can have a real impact across sectors and at a large scale. And we as an organization have been invited to many of these kind of convenings or um, kind of brainstorms where, by funders who aren't saying we want you to do this or we want you to work in this way, but they're saying you and these other groups assembled here today are working in this space. Can you help us to identify and understand the problem mm -hmm. so that we can properly target our resources? And that, that seems something that has just begun to happen in the last couple of years. I, I'd like to add that uh, past is prologue. Mm -hmm. And what are we doing now that will be the past three to 10 years from now? Exactly. We have created the largest cohort in human history of people who are engaged in and inclined to solve problems through the social sector. Mm -hmm. Why? Because 30 years ago, we started diminishing the value of government as the problem solver of first resort. Mm -hmm. And I don't know that this is necessarily a great thing. But you, many of you students in this room, have been steeped in the sense that social entrepreneurship is the prime mode of civic problem solving. And you will be out there starting new organizations, mm -hmm. making things happen. Here's what I would ask is that you extend that notion of social entrepreneurship into work in business and in government, mm -hmm. and not just cons reserve it for efforts of starting new organizations in the nonprofit sector. I think we have a crisis of government in this country and a crisis of faith that government as a big problem solver on a scale that no single, no network of nonprofits can humanly possible, it, it, can possibly address. Government can do it better, yes, with down, downsides like bureaucracy. But you've got to take on that social entrepreneurship role and not confine it strictly to the social sector. Go govern. Occupy government, okay? <laughs> I read a planning theory article when I was in graduate school uh, called Gorillas in the Bureaucracy. <laughs> and it really gave uh, you know, face to uh, you know, creating change from inside. Uh, so I really, I think echoing that, that vision of the future is really important because we do need civic leadership that extends you know, throughout you know, the, the public and private sectors. And, if, um, and I think nonprofits are largely really a creature of the private side. Um, you know, it, are there three sectors? Maybe. Uh, but in any case, we know that there's at least two. Um, and, and having them be um, working more cohesively together is, is uh, you know, what, what I hope to see too. Thank you so much for a very engaging and insightful discussion. Please join me in thanking Paul, Kalina, and Wendy for speaking at the afternoon. Great guys, all right. I want to take one more second just to thank Alice and all of our wonderful panelists for that great discussion. We want to continue this discussion in the upcoming sessions. Um, one quick note, we have a logistical change to your programs. Due to earlier concerns of rain this week, we have shifted our um, reception, which is supposed to be in Lower Kravis, to McKenna Auditorium. There will be guides who will help show you the way to get there from source, but just so you know, that is no longer correct. Um, right before I wrap up, I want to take a moment to welcome Sarah Smith Orr to come up and make a few comments. Sarah is the di executive director of the Kravis Leadership Institute, which has been a phenomenal support to SOURCE for many, many years. Thank you. Thank you. And what I'd like to do is to thank Sarah and, and Alice for their tremendous leadership. They have been an extraordinary group to work with, and uh, I have worked with SOURCE now five years, so half of your lifetime, and have seen this amazing group 
grow in professionalism in, in their work in the community, within the college, and taking their expertise to make a difference in the world. So I'm extremely proud to have been a part of SOURCE and extremely proud of what they've done for you today. So thank you both. Um, so for our first session, there are going to be two options.